Well, amen, saints. I think on yesterday, uh, when I woke up, I felt so good. I just had to put out a bolo. It's a good day to praise the Lord. And I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus and no prayer too small that God cannot hear. All right, all right, people, come on, come on. There's no prayer too small that God cannot hear. So don't ever think when you're praying, God ain't going to hear me because I don't know what to say. He just want to hear your voice. He just want to hear your voice. And when you talk to him, talk to him from your heart. Talk to him from your heart and see how good you feel afterwards. And see how good you feel afterwards because he desires to inhabit our praises. Don't you know prayer is a form of praise? It's a form of praise. So, Heavenly Father, we just want to approach your throne this morning. Lord, we know that it is only through Jesus that we can come to your throne of grace. But you told us, Lord, that we can come boldly in his name. Well, Lord God, let that, that boldness be uh, pride, but in humility. So, Father God, as I allow the Holy Spirit to use me this morning, Lord God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted in your sight, O Lord, my strength and redeemer. And whoever has an ear to hear what the Lord is saying, let them hear what the Lord is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, let me get my things together here. I was kind of troubled by the subject I have for today. Um, well, what I want to talk to us about is we've been talking about victory. Pastor started us in a series about victory and the victory that we have in Jesus. And so he's, we've been teaching us how we learn to live in that victory that we have in Jesus. But sometimes I think, in my own opinion, that we forget that we have the victory in Jesus because we keep trying to fight the fight that he's already won. And so that's what I want to talk to us about today. Stop fighting the fight that's already been won. And I want to come to you with that. I guess I better put on glasses so I can see it. Um, amen. From um, John chapter 16. Let me turn this around so I can see it. Praise God, God, y'all, y'all just be patient with me. Whoops, that's upside down. Um, when John chapter 16, uh, okay, all right, the Holy Spirit's still with me, but um, <laughs> all right. Praise God, folks. Praise God. When you're trying to use technology and uh, it gets in your way, you have to call on the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verses 33. And it says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. 
And that's our victory that we have in Jesus because he has overcome the world. But there are many Christians under the Christian banner who are battling Satan every which way they turn. Now, granted, to, granted that he is busy and his demons are active to seek and to seem who he may destroy. And because there are many who are falling prey to his schemes of the evil one, they lose sight of the fact that we don't have to fight this battle because this battle has already been won. And so in this series of learning how to live victorious in Jesus Christ, um, in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 says, For in the case of those who have been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of the Lord and the powers of the age to come, and then they're falling away, it is impossible to renew again to repentance since, since, since they again crucify themselves, the Son of God, to put them to shame. So if you're trying to go into battle with Satan and encouraging him, going into confrontation with him, you can't do that. You will lose because he's stronger than you, because God says that the battle is his, it's not yours. He fights the battle, and the battle has already been won. So let's go back to Genesis and where it all began. So if we'll go back to Genesis chapter 3, Every time I think about this, I think about that trick question pastor put on us. <laughs> put on our quiz. <laughs> so in Genesis in chapter 3, um, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from the fruit of the garden. And the woman said to the serpents, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, not touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, Surely you shall not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. But when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and for a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took up the fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then their eyes were both open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves to, together to hide themselves. So that was the guilt. So they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and when the man and his wife had heard, hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees in the garden, then God said, called to the man and said, Where are you? This is a question and answer period. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Another question. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? Then the man said, now the blame comes, and the man said, the woman who gave me this to be with me, you gave, she gave me this from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, what have you done? And she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord said, now this is where we get to the meat of, the, of it. Because you have done this to the serpent, cursed are you more than all of the cattle more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat in all the days of your life. Now, this is where we're coming. When he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he will bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. Okay, so in that promise right there, 
in that verse right there, the promise of redemption is set forth because Adam and Eve had brought sin onto an unsinless place in the Garden of Eden. There was no sin. They brought sin in by giving over and um, uh, leaning into what Satan had said to them. Instead, now that the dominion that they have, now Satan has it. Now Satan has, they had given it to them. So, in other words, Satan wants to be their God now. Satan wants to be their God now. And so, because now that dominion has been given over to him, the earth is his domain because man has already given it to him. And so, now God is going to send in a redeemer to bring us back. And it starts right here in this verse. Because when God decided that he wanted Adam and Eve to be with him, but in this state that they're in now, they could not. And so at the end, he says, uh, now that the man... Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, that he might stretch forth his hands and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent them out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove them out at the east of the Garden of Eden and stationed a cherubim to the flaming sword, which turned every which to reckon to God it. They, remember, they still had the right to eat from that tree. But the, the reason why he put them out was so that they would not take hold of it and live forever in this sinless state. And so therefore, the Redeemer, the one who is going to crush Satan's head, is going to have to come. And the Bible tells us that he's going to come down through 42 generations through, through David. And so now we see if we... Isaiah chapter 42 gives us a picture of the, of the, um, Isaiah 42 gives us a picture of the, the coming Messiah. Okay? So, uh, this isn't in alphabetical order, I'm sorry. Y'all have to excuse me, please. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. I don't type out every word of the Bible, okay? So I've got to read it as it is, okay? Okay, let's go to Isaiah 42 so that the word will be correctly divided, that we rightly divide the word of truth. So we're going to look at Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nation. He will not cry out, arise, his, raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he's established justice on the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Thus says the Lord. Now, if we look at Jesus Christ and his life and his ministry as he taught, as he taught on his ministry, even... even the Old Testament talks about it all the way through, and Isaiah gives a picture of it. All through the Bible, we see pictures of the coming of the Messiah. Joel talks about it in his, in, in, uh, his, his, uh, his chapter, in his book. And so, in the crush, crush, he was to crush the serpent's seed. 
And so when it to crush the serpent's seed, the serpent was going to bruise his heel. Now, y'all have to stay with me because I'm running around it, around, but not always in a circle, but I'm going to come back. But he, he has to crush Satan's head. Pastor talked about crushing Satan's head. And so he had told us uh, that he had uh, told one of our ministers that, what would you do if I told you I was going to crush your head? And he said, I'll do everything I can to keep you from crushing my head. And that's what Satan had tried to do all the way from the time when God in the Garden of Eden said that he was going to crush his head all the way up until the crucifixion. Satan tried to destroy Jesus Christ. So many times we see that the Pharisees, they wanted to kill Jesus all through his ministry, but he said, my time has not come, and you're not going to touch me. Amen. So all through, the, through his, his ministry, they were trying to kill him. But the time when he said it was right, he called his disciples together. And when he calls his disciples together, he talked to them about what was going to happen. And so when we, he talked to them about what was going to happen, he was going to tell them that he was going to be crucified. But before that, he told them he was going to have to go back to his father. But before I leave, I'm going to send you a helper to take, in other words, to take my place and to keep you in perfect peace. And so that was the promise of the Holy Spirit, which was talked about and which was sent on the day of Pentecost. So if we look at John, so if we look at John chapter 16, uh, starting with verse 8. He says, now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me where I'm going because I have said to you that these things of sorrow will fill your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. And if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I do go away, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment and concerning sin because I go to the Father and you no longer see me and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has already been judged. Because Satan has already been judged. Satan was judged at the the coming of his birth, when he came into this world, Satan had already been judged. And I have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak on his own initiative, but what you hear, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you, and all things that the Father has are mine, and therefore he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Now that's a promise that God gave to, to the disciples, the promise of coming of the Holy Spirit, because he knew he was coming upon his time for when he was going to have to leave this world. And then Satan is going to bruise his heel at the cross. Satan is going to bruise his heel at the cross. Now, I want to say this. Now, some time ago, but I hadn't heard it recently, I heard the song that said, I went into Satan's den and stole back what he took from me. No. No, if you go into Satan's den and try to take back what he stole for you, 
There's a passage in the Bible, too, that says the demon talked to the uh, person who was ta- he was talking to and said, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? So in other words, you can't contend with him. God didn't give that to you to contend with him because that's his job. The battle is his. It is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. So don't try to get in a confrontational argument with Satan. You'll lose. So Jesus talks about his death. So when he talks about his death, he tells him um, in verse... um, Uh, at uh, verse can't see it, 30, 32. Uh, and now that you all know all things and you need for no one else to question you, but by this we believe that you have come from God. And Jesus says, do you believe? Behold, the hour is come and is ready, already come when you of you will be scattered, each to his own home, and leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you will have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. When he said he has overcome the world, that, that means it, he has done it. You don't need to do anything else except believe him. Believe his word. Stand on his word. And to know that his word is true. You cannot change it. He died for our sins. That was when the, the curse, would, uh, the promise that Satan would bruise his heel. Because Satan thought he had him when he died. But the thing about it is, the scripture tells us that his bones were not broken, no, nor would his body see decay. So if his bones was not broken on the cross, then when he went into the grave and he rose up in three days, his body didn't see decay. And so that is the truth. That was the scriptures fulfilled. So if we'll look at John 20, at the crucifixion, start with verse 11. And Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping and so she wept and she stood and looked in and she saw two angels in white sitting one on one hand and the other at his feet where the body of Jesus had lain and he said to her woman why are you weeping and she said because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they laid him and when she had said this she turned and saw Jesus standing there but did not know it was Jesus And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and saw him. And she turned and she saw him. And in Hebrew, she said, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go and tell my brothers, I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God. 
The empty tomb contests, convicts us that Satan's head has been crushed. The battle has been fought and the battle has been won. We don't have to do anything else to try to get to Jesus. He said, oh, if you believe in me that I was sent from the Father, you shall have eternal life. You don't have to go into try to go into Satan's den to take back what he's done wrong from you because Jesus already done it. You don't have to fight the battle that has already been won. All you need to do is stand still and see the salvation salvation of the Lord as he has already fought the battle and the battles have been won. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 20 through 27 and then I'll drop down to 54. But now that Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who were asleep. For since by one man death came, and by also one man came the resurrection from the dead, for as in Adam all die, as also in Christ all will be made alive. But each to in his own order, Christ, the first fruit of his coming, and the, then comes the end. And when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, and he will establish all rules and authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that's to be abolished is death. But we know that the Penalty of sin was death. So at Jesus' resurrection, the penalty of sin was death. And so it goes on to say that for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put into subjection, that means Satan. It is evident that he is expected to put all things into subjection unto him. So when the imperishable have put on the imperishable and the immortal have put on immortality, then we'll come to know the saying that is written, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the victory. We need to learn to live in the victory that Jesus has bought for us. And the way that we do this, we have to stand. So we know that in Hebrews, now Ephesians. I'm going to get through this, Lord. I'm going to get through this. So in 2 Chronicles, going back to the Old Testament, he says, Do not be dismayed because of this great multitude of the battle, but the battle is not yours, but it's God. You need not fight this battle because Jesus has already won this battle. But station yourself, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. So standing firm means resisting the evil one. James tells us that resist the devil and he will flee from you. He didn't tell us to get into the conversation, confrontation with the devil, but resist him. So you resist him by standing firm on the word of God and unto the, the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ unto life that we will also have be resurrected with him in life. So, I'm about to come to the end now. I, I'm not going to be long-winded with this. So, in all, thank you. For, <laughs> thank you for not being long-winded, right? <laughs> all right. But anyway, sometimes you have to chuckle. Uh, but anyways, when you're standing firm, 
you're resisting the devil. So only Jesus can handle Satan. And he has already handled Satan. But his demonic spirits are still alive, running around trying to see whom they can destroy or whom they can throw off balance in that walk with Christ. But when we stand firm, we have to do something else. We have to put on the whole armor of God. So I said every day before you put on your outer garments, put on the full armor of God. Be strong in the Lord and in his strength and in his might. And when you put on the full, full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes and the wiles of the evil one. You can't do it without it. And it said, for we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against the spiritual forces and weaknesses in high places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your lawns with truth and putting on the blessed freight of righteousness and having your feet shod with truth and having put on the blessed freight of righteousness, shod, put your shoes on and prepare, prepare yourself with the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith for which you will be able to distinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit so that the word of God, which you have done, that you can just be able to stand. Stand. Stand for holiness, stand for righteousness, and believe it, and you shall receive it when you stand. You need to hold tight, and you need not fight the battle, because the battle has already been won. We must seek the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to learn this victorious life in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much.